All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. My name is Abby Andrews, and for my senior capstone project, I worked with Dr. Ron Rabb, and we were researching the tuberculosis genes to further understand the deadly pathogen. So tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's a small bacillus, and it has a very lipid-rich cell wall, meaning that it's a hardy bacteria. And this allows the bacteria to actually live in the environment without a host, for um, usually around up to a week. Um, and this way, you know, that means that it can stay on doorknobs, it can stay on tables, and you can actually pick it up in the environment without having it transfer from a host. Um, another thing about tuberculosis is it has a, an extremely low infectious dose. It only takes about 10 microorganisms to infect um, a healthy adult. So obviously, you know, that's not a whole lot of bacteria there that will get into you and really uh, make you sick. Um, and it is pretty slow growing. It only divides about once every 15 to 20 hours. So that means that even once it's in your body, it takes a while for it to start showing symptoms or the bacteria can lie latent in your body for up to years at a time um, and then just kind of decide when it's ready to um, wreak havoc, basically. And once those symptoms start to present, you're going to see fevers, you're going to see constant coughing, coughing up blood, um, there will be fatigue, loss of appetite, and weight loss. The patient will start to become very emaciated. Um, it's really just a very harrowing disease and it's very difficult to, um, to deal with. And if you're not seeking or able to get correct treatment for this, it's a very slow disease and you can die from it after a while. So here I have two chest x-rays side by side. The one on the right here, we see is very clear in the lungs. All we really see is the ribs. Um, however, this one on the left, we see lots of bacterial growth in the lungs, and that's really tuberculosis growing in your lungs. It's basically filling it up. It makes the breathing extremely labored, which is why you're coughing so much, coughing up blood. You're trying to cough this bacteria out of your lungs. Um, and I mean, basically at this point, you're like drowning in bacteria. It's pretty gross. Um, a recent study at MIT shows that sneezes, when they leave our body, are traveling a lot faster and farther than we originally thought. So a sneeze will leave your body at approximately 100 miles an hour and can travel up to 20 feet. Um, and that's just a lot farther and faster than we were originally thinking. So that means that um, when you sneeze without covering your mouth, you're sending this spray out pretty far and if you have a bacteria like tuberculosis, you're infecting a lot of people with it. Um, the drop particles that leave your mouth can range in size from 10 to 20 micrometers. Um, in contrast, the human hair is about 17 micrometers in diameter, so it's pretty tiny. Um, and the optimal size for a uh, a particle to stay in the atmosphere is five micrometers. So we're seeing the smaller particles are definitely gonna be in the atmosphere for a while and easy for people to breathe in. And once that bacteria is in your lungs, then um, because it's such a low infectious dose, it can very quickly um, take hold and start to spread. So a brief history of tuberculosis. Um, when it was first identified, it was before people knew what bacteria was. So obviously people didn't understand that it was caused by bacteria. They thought that it was punishment for something that they've done in their life, basically, and they called it consumption. And they truly believed that the only cure for it was fresh air and sunlight. And that's why in old tuberculosis sanatoriums, all the beds were actually outside. So rain or shine, hot or cold, the patients were left outside when they were presenting symptoms because they really thought that that's how they cured the disease. Um, it was known as the White Plague, and in the early, in the late 18th and early 19th century, it was the number one killer in industrializations. It killed about one out of every seven living people during that time. And then um, in the mid-1950s, early to mid-1950s, antibiotics were discovered and we started to be able to treat this finally. So here's a graph just in the United States. From 1953, we had almost 100,000 reported cases of tuberculosis, whereas over in 2015 here, we have under 10,000. So that's a tenfold difference within really 60 years, um, and it's all due to antibiotic use. Now, while this condition has gotten better in the United States, it has gotten worse 
in other parts of the country or in other parts of the world, especially underdeveloped countries. Um, so because they have poor hygiene lots of times, they're living in very close quarters, once one person gets it, it's extremely easy to transfer that disease to other people. Um, and there are new strains now that are not susceptible to antibiotics that we used to use to cure tuber tuberculosis. So there's a multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. And both of these require extensive drug regimens that can last for months to get rid of this bacteria. And again, it's still extremely contagious. So you know, when one person gets it and spreads it around, it's just becoming extensively difficult to treat. One thing I did was look up all the drugs required in a multi-drug resistant tuberculosis regimen, and it came up with all these drugs, um, which you're taking all of these for months at a time maybe, and you know, each drug comes with a list of side effects that's about a mile long, so when you pile seven or eight drugs together, you know, it's really detrimental to your body. So I looked up the prices for these as well to see how affordable it was. And in the United States, to treat multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, it's over $600. Now that's no chunk of change for anybody. Um, and especially with the healthcare crisis happening in the United States, this is becoming an issue. And as you can imagine, if something is $600 in the United States, in an underdeveloped country where healthcare is less accessible, the price is going to be a much, much, much higher. So Dr. Mario Gravenglioni, the director of the Global Tuberculosis Program at the World Health Organization, has pointed out that seven countries of the world contribute to almost two-thirds of all of the tuberculosis cases in the world. So on this map, we see the dark blue countries have less cases of tuberculosis, whereas the lighter blue and into the reds have higher cases. So we see definitely here in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're seeing a lot of cases, and that is also due to the prevalence of HIV AIDS in that area. Obviously, if your body is already, um, if your immune system is already compromised, it's gonna be much easier for this bacteria to take hold of you and um, eventually kill you. That same doctor says, tuberculosis is competing with HIV AIDS as the number one killer among infectious diseases. There are about 450,000 new drug resistant tuberculosis cases every year, and this is the scariest part of tuberculosis, as you are left with less options to treat people, many of which are toxic. So we're really just running out of drugs to treat tuberculosis, and again, these drugs have lots of side effects. They're just extremely detrimental to your body. In 2016, there were 10.4 million cases of tuberculosis reported worldwide and 1.7 million deaths attributed to tuberculosis worldwide. In contrast, there were 1.4 million new HIV cases reported worldwide. So we see there's actually a tenfold difference in tuberculosis cases versus HIV. So we're definitely seeing at this point that it's becoming a crisis. It's really, you know, kind of mushrooming out of control. I have a short video for you now. If TB is a problem anywhere in the world, it's a problem everywhere. Just like the carbon emissions and the pollution from India or from China make their way halfway around the world, patients with TB also make their way halfway around the world. The distinction between having something a mile away or 10,000 miles away will go away with time, especially as the world just gets smaller. TB, unfortunately, in spite of or because it's been around for millennia, is a major problem. This is a tough foe, a really tough challenge. It's not only the fact that we have been really so poor at conquering it, but the resistance to the drugs that have been around for quite a few years now has gotten worse and worse. And if we don't find new treatments or new preventatives very quickly, then the problem of drug resistance could truly become a universal problem around the world in every country and could really mushroom into a major issue. I loved what he said about how if tuberculosis is an issue anywhere, it's an issue everywhere. So at this point, it's almost our responsibility as countries with more um, access to science, more resources, 
to start looking into new and novel and more effective treatments for tuberculosis. And in order to do that, we need to look at how tuberculosis affects our body and how it works within our immune system. So in our immune system, we have these guys called macrophages. They're a type of white blood cell, and ordinarily it's our first line of defense as our immune system. When foreign bodies enter our body, the macrophage doesn't really discriminate, it just goes and grabs it, it pulls it into its own body, and then it has enzymes in there that basically digest the foreign material. Um, and we would think that that's what it would do with something like tuberculosis as well. Although, it's hiding from the macrophage. Now, what we're thinking is happening is somehow it's kind of cloaking itself and hiding within vacuoles of the macrophage. Um, so in September of 2017, the Center of Molecular Inflammation Research is studying Mycobacterium avium. Um, and if you remember, tuberculosis is also a Mycobacterium, so you can probably conclude that they work kind of similarly. And this is actually um, an image here. The gray is the macrophage, and then this green in here are M. avium. Um, so they're really just kind of sitting in the macrophage and hiding. Um, so we're not really sure how they get in there or how they hide and how they avoid being you know, eaten by the macrophages, but it's working somehow. Um, and this is why our, our own immune system has such a hard time dealing with tuberculosis. So going into that, um, the product that I did this year, um, we wanted to learn more about its pathogenicity. So we looked at two specific genes, um, and this was a collaboration with Dr. Sohasky at the VA hospital at Long Beach. Um, so when tuberculosis is hiding in the macrophage, it has one big weakness, and that is nitrogen deprivation. Um, once tuberculosis runs out of nitrogen, it basically kind of implodes on itself. It can't survive without nitrogen. So the genes we're looking at are kind of suicide genes. So um, they will destroy the cell membrane and the cell wall of their own cell because those are high in nitrogen. And that way the tuberculosis cells around them can feed off of that nitrogen and take advantage of that and keep living with um, the nitrogen that's provided from them. So um, RV0420 is a hole in gene. It kind of pokes holes in the membrane and allows IPQM to get out. It's a hydrolyze and it targets the cell walls. And once, obviously once the cell membrane and the cell wall are compromised, the cell itself dies. Um, and that's why I'm calling it a suicide gene kind of. Um, but it still benefits the other tuberculosis genes that are around it, allowing them to get the nitrogen. So our goal for this was to clone, express, and purify these genes into E. coli just so we could learn a little bit more about them. The first one we really focused on was IPQM. It's about 1.5 kilobase pairs and almost 500 amino acids. So what we did with this basically was we took the gene itself and a plasmid and we genetically engineered restriction sites onto those so that they kind of fit together like puzzle pieces. Um, and then we performed PCR or polymerase chain reactions. And then through a process called transformation, we put the bacteria, I'm sorry, we put the plasmid into our E. coli host bacteria. This was the plasmid we used. Um, also in this plasmid is a gene for antibiotic resistance, and this is what we call our selectable marker. Um, so um, when we played our bacteria, we played it on an ampicillin plate. An ampicillin is a type of antibiotic. So if the plasmid gets into the bacteria and it has this antibiotic resistance, the bacteria will grow on this plate. But if the bacteria didn't pick up the plasmid with the antibiotic resistance, it wouldn't be able to grow on the blade. So this way we can ensure that any bacteria we have growing are bacteria with our plasmid in it. Um, it's not 100%, however, that our gene gets into our plasmid. Ordinarily this happens, but sometimes there are issues and it just doesn't quite get in there. So that's why we um, do lots of samples, do lots of trials, and make sure that we have some, at least some, with our gene of interest. So we do this, and it doesn't work. Um, we use a process called gel electrophoresis to check if our gene is in there, and the numbers just weren't adding up. It wasn't correct. It wasn't what we were expecting to see. And we didn't understand why it didn't work, um, although this sounds a little complicated. This is 
pretty basic for a biotechnology laboratory. Um, so we weren't sure what was going wrong, so we decided to try a different plasmid. Same process, same antibiotic resistant tag, um, just a different plasmid. We thought that maybe this would help. And for some reason, it still didn't work. Now, for those of you that are ISAT students and have taken ISAT 305, like you've done this already. It's not that difficult. We shouldn't be facing this many issues with it. Um, and then we started to notice something odd with our growth. So in this image, you can see this tube has very thick and cloudy bacterial growth, whereas this one is very clear. You can see the pipette tip through it, and you can almost see my hand behind it as well. Um, and what we're seeing, this is normal bacterial growth. This is what we expect to see, and we're not sure why this one is so clear. So this happened at the end of January. We see this happen again mid-February. Again, we see very thick bacterial growth, very cloudy. You can't see through it at all. Whereas this side, we see the pipette tip, we see the words on the paper behind it, it's extremely clear. And you might be thinking, well, just nothing grew. But I'll show you. Something did grow. And we see this because of, um, very scientifically, we have some gunk over here. Um, on the pipette tip, there's a little bit of residue. Um, and what that means is something definitely grew and then lysed itself. So because of this IPQM gene that destroys its own cell wall, kills the cell, we see that there was cell growth, and then the cells literally killed themselves. So what we can conclude is, you know, these bacteria picked up the plasmid, but the plasmid did not have the gene in it. Whereas this one had the gene, had the plasmid with the gene in it. And that's why we're seeing um, the bacterial growth and then the lysing. So at this point, we decided that's um, about as far as we're going to get with IPQM this semester. So we move on to RVO420 to see if we see any kind of similar results. RVO420 is about a third of the size of IPQM, um, just a little bit smaller there. Um, and it's very special because almost every gene starts with the sequence ATG. It's our start codon. RVO420 started with TTG which is extremely rare to find a wild type bacteria, a wild type gene that starts with something other than an ATG. Um, so the first thing we did was clone an ATG on there because we thought it would help with expression. It did not. Um, it was so lethal with ATG, we could not get anything to grow. Um, all of the colonies that we grew up were misshapen and deformed. They were completely unviable, so we couldn't use them. Um, and at this point, we went back and we put the TTG back on, and then we also experimented with a GTG gene. So we took both of those, the TTG and the GTG, and put them into separate pet duet vectors. Um, and then we did the exact same process we did with IPQM, with the restriction sites, PCR, transformation, and put it into E. coli host cells again. And we did a similar experiment. So on the top here, we have an uninduced TTG. Um, and basically what that means is the gene is in there, but it's not turned on. Um, here we have it, the induced TTG and the induced GTG. Um, and again, as you can see, the top one, you can't see through the paper at all. It's extremely cloudy. Um, whereas these ones, you can definitely see the writing on the paper through the growth liquid, um, the growth medium. So again, we're seeing that these cells have started to grow and then lyse themselves, which is honestly what we expect IPQM and RVO420 to do based on what we're theorizing that they do in the cell um, in vivo. So after we poured out the TTG, the growth medium, the lyse cells kind of stayed in the beaker. It was a very viscous, almost mucousy substance. Um, which this image gives a great shot at just how mucousy it was. It was very, um, my professor lovingly refers to it as cell snot, um, because that's really honestly what it looks like. It kind of looks like snot in a beaker. Um, so basically, these are lysed cells. This is everything that's left behind after the cell is lysed. So basically, just the cell wall, the cell membrane, um, all the like junk, basically. 
So from these, we can conclude that RVO420 is extremely lethal, but can be con controlled with a rare codon. We can express but not purify these genes. However, their physiology is very apparent in host E. coli cells, as we saw with the lysing with both the IPQM and the RVO420. Future work in this, we could use a rare code on IBQM to control its expression to try to do more with the gene before it kills itself. Um, we could use a knockout gene to try to get rid of the promoter so the genes can be studied without killing the cells. And finally, we can clone out the entire operon with a mutated IPQM and compare that to the functional IPQM just to factor out and show that it is actually IPQM that's causing the issue. If, you know, if the IPQM isn't working, then we shouldn't see any cell dying. Um, and that's all I have for you today. Are there any questions? So were you actually working with mycobacterium tuberculosis in the lab? <laughs> no, um, our labs are not suitable for tuberculosis. I think that that's a BSL-3. So I um, have to go in there with like the whole space suit and gloves and JMU labs are not um, equipped for that. So these are just gene products. There was no, um, there. I mean, you really couldn't get infected with just the gene itself because it didn't have, you know, the virulence factors that the whole um, genome would have, the whole bacteria. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you.